Welcome to Revival Cycles Tech Talk. I'm Stefan, and in this episode, we are going to cover the basic theory of electricity as it applies to motorcycles. Stick around, this one should be fun. All right, so we get a lot of questions, and in those questions, it usually becomes a little bit apparent to me, at least, that not everyone has a complete understanding of how DC electricity works. And so I want to just go over some of the basics of how DC electricity works. And before we get into all the details and the rest of that stuff, here's the disclaimer. This is applied electrical theory. This is not academic electrical theory. Yes, there's all kinds of nuance and details that someone who's got an electric, electrical engineering degree uh, would point out where I'm going to say things that are wrong or they're different or backwards or whatever, but yeah, 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 that's the, the academic details. We're talking about the practical details of how do you make this stuff work on a bike and don't worry about it. What we're going to cover is accurate and appropriate for applying this knowledge to wiring a motorcycle. Um, we're back on a whiteboard for this one, so sorry, but here it comes. Um, the first thing that we really want to work out is just kind of what, what uh, some of the vocabulary means. And we'll start out, we've got, we've got a few variables. Um, we've got voltage, uh, we've got current, and we've got um, resistance, which is ohms. So resistance, ohms. Uh, we also have a few things like uh, capacitors or capacitance. Uh, there's also uh, diodes. Uh, so we've got a little bit of a mix here. Uh, so voltage and current are kind of more of a conceptual thing. Uh, resistance, ohms, resistors, that's more of a discrete component. Uh, capacitors, also a discrete component, and diodes, discrete component. But what does all this stuff mean in terms of like what it's doing? Uh, if you think about voltage, <clears throat> the easiest way that I find to think about voltage is um, in terms of potential. So this is a potential energy. This has got the potential to do work. It has the potential to cause electrons to move around in the system and to potential to make lights light up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and one of the easier ways to think about that uh, kind of thematically or, or conceptually is, is with a plumbing analogy or a, a fluid power analogy. Uh, so on this side, I'm going to draw some uh, kind of fluid power demonstrations. And on this side, I'm going to draw the actual um, electrical equivalent of that. So if we start with voltage, um, let's consider that we've got like this water tank up here. And it's high above the ground. So we'll call, you know, this is our, our water tank and it's got some crazy lattice support that holds it all up. And this has a bunch of water in it. And this is ground. So right now, the water really wants to be down here. If you were to pop a hole in this, it would all just, you know, spill out down to the ground. So that's where it wants to go. It wants to do that naturally. Now on the electrical equivalent side, uh, that's gonna be a battery. So we just call that a battery. It's got a positive and a negative. Um, so now we've got this kind of potential. The, in the battery example, the potential is it wants to go from the positive to the negative. Um, again, academic guys, you can, we can talk about the details of what's going on there, but just conceptually, it's much easier, in my opinion, to think about it in terms of uh, the current flowing from positive to negative. So just play along. Positive to negative, that's how that's trying to go. In this case, this is kind of like positive, and this is kind of like negative. The water wants to flow from positive to negative. Next thing, uh, current. So current is the actual flow. If we were to put a pipe in here, like we said, and have it come out, all the water comes out and it flows down to ground. Same thing, and it would do that as fast as possible, as fast as it could possibly get through that pipe. Same thing, if we added a wire that went from positive to negative, Lots of current flows, it would flow as quickly as possible, and depending on the size of that wire, we'd either destroy the battery or light the wire on fire. That brings us to resistance. In order to kind of control the amount of flow that we get, you need to have um, what's called a load. And that means um, something that's actually going to do work or something that 
reduces the amount of flow so it doesn't just all dump the water onto the ground immediately. Um, the electrical symbol for resistance is <clears throat> um, just kind of a, a zigzag squiggle. Uh, electrically, it looks like something like that. Um, in the fluid example, think about this more like a, like a faucet valve, like a needle valve. This is something where um, you know, you go to the sink and you can kind of gradually open the valve. The more you open it, the more flow you get. That's resistance. The more open, the less resistance. Um, so if we kind of have that in here, we've got this valve that we can open and close and that will change how much flow comes through. <clears throat> Of course, resistors typically are gonna have a fixed resistance. Potentiometers are the type that actually have a little knob that you can change. We don't use potentiometers very often in uh, motorcycle electrics, although the one main uh, caveat to that would be the TPS sensor on modern bikes. That's basically a potentiometer. Uh, it's got a variable resistance, but that's way outside the scope for this conversation. Just know it exists. So now we've kind of gotten through the concept of resistance. Uh, capacitance is kind of a neat one. These are where capacitors come in. Uh, again, this isn't really something that you run into very often with motorcycles. Every now and then you'll see it for a battery elimination setup where you just use a capacitor instead of a battery on some of the older kickstart only bikes that have really simple and rudimentary systems. Easiest way to think about a capacitor is kind of like a balloon. So if I were to tie a balloon into this system and kind of have that right here. We've got this little balloon. As the pressure, if, especially if I keep this capped off, as the potential in this tank wants to go down to ground, it goes through, it flows through the resistor and it fills up this balloon, right? It starts to fill this balloon up and that kind of stores potential, but it stores it in a temporary way and typically doesn't store that much energy. So it's just kind of like a little buffer. It gives a little bit of a place for potential energy to be kind of temporarily stored. And then if we were to now shut this valve, so we no longer have any flow through there, we basically break that circuit, this potential is still here. If I then were to open up this circuit, now we actually get flow to ground and the water all comes out of the balloon and it shrinks back down to very, very small. So again, just kind of how the capacitor works. If this all gets connected and this is disconnected, our balloon fills up with the potential. And then when this is closed and this is open, now all of a sudden that flows and shrinks it all back down. Again, capacitors don't really need to know too much about them, not the end of the world, uh, but Still handy to know that they exist and kind of to understand why you might use it as a battery elimination or a battery replacement that doesn't work with all motorcycles. If it works with yours, you'll probably read about it in the forums. Don't get hung up on that. Uh, last one, diodes. Uh, diodes are basically a one-way valve and these can come in handy um, for some of the lighting circuits and some of like the uh, safety interlock switches. So conceptually what a diode is, is a one-way valve. Uh, the electrical symbol for that one second, we'll go back and catch that, uh, the capacitance symbol. Capacitance uh, really just looks like two plates and that symbolizes that it's not really a connection. It's got the ability to pass some current, but it's not like it just flows the way a resistor does. Um, that's the symbol for capacitance. And then the symbol for a diode is basically just an arrow with a bar on one end. And that means that current can flow from the positive to the negative. It can flow through this, but if for any reason the current tries to go this way, or if you hook this up um, in a circuit where this side's positive, that side's negative, no current flows. This is basically blocked on this side, but it does allow it to go that way. In the, uh, in the, in the fluid example, you still, you've got this kind of one-way valve that as the fluid flows, it allows the valve to open. And then if the fluid flows the other way, it shuts and you get no flow. Um, so that's kind of the, the, uh, the different analogs or the analogies across the two and just a very high level kind of conceptual uh, standpoint. So now that we've got a little bit of a gist of what we're talking about in terms of vocabulary and kind of what, what motive forces or what these things try to accomplish, let's think about 
what really happens. <clears throat> so on your motorcycle, let's just take a really simple example. You've got your headlight. So let's say we've got a battery, positive, negative. You've got a headlight. Um, so then if we run power from the headlight or from the battery to the headlight, that's great, but nothing happens yet because we haven't completed the circuit. There's nowhere for this potential energy to go. Um, what we would need to do is connect this back to the negative. And once we do that, now there is actually a path for current to flow out this way and to flow back this way. And when that happens, all right, now we get lights. So if you set up like this, of course, it's always on. That won't work. We need to add a switch. And an electrical schematic for a switch is very basic. It just looks something kind of like that. And now this demonstrates a switch. If you were to push on this, it would close. That would complete the circuit. Again, we've got current flow. One of the things that kind of comes up at this stage is it's useful to be able to determine, well, how much current flows? Well, how much uh, power is actually in this, in this system? And so there are a couple of really simple equations. Don't get freaked out by the math. This stuff is not that difficult. Um, the first thing, if we wanted to, let's just take a practical example. What gauge wire do we need to use with this headlight? Now, a typical H4 headlight is a 55, uh, 60 watt type headlight. That means low beam is 55 watts, high beam is 60 watts. Um, and that means that it has a specific power consumption of watts. If you were to take a voltmeter and measure the resistance of a light bulb, you're not gonna get that much and there's some science behind why that happens. You won't get an accurate reading for the resistance and that means you can't calculate the, um, the current flow simply using Ohm's law. The easier way to do it is to actually start with the wattage and use the power equation, which is watts equals current times voltage. So the symbol for current is I. I'm not exactly sure why that is, it just is. Uh, and then of course voltage is V, and in this case power, because we're interested in watts, easy enough, just use that one for W. We know the, uh, the wattage, and let's say, let's just take 60, because we'll do some, some quicker math that way. Um, 60 equals, the thing we're trying to figure out is I, and this is a 12 volt system. In order to find I, just divide 60 by 12, and that means that 60 divided by 12 equals five, five amps. So five amps needs to flow through this system. Well, that's, that's well and good. Um, that means five amps, really the wire that we would need to select not that critical, anything over probably uh, 22, 20 gauge should be able to handle five amps, no problem. But in general, uh, I would still suggest using an 18 gauge wire for all of your lighting applications. It's just good practice. It's a little easier to work with, less likely that they fatigue and break because of the stranding being too small. But still, at least now you know that you're safe. You've checked it. It's five amps for the headlight and 18 gauge wire is just fine. I mentioned Ohm's law. It's another one that's really handy. Sometimes it's just worth it to be able to make a calculation on uh, what the resistance would be, what the voltage would be for a given current or um, different things. And Ohm's law is also very simple. It is uh, V voltage equals I current times resistance R. And in this example, um, let's say we've got a, another very simple circuit and we've got our battery and then we've got um, just a resistor. In this case, this is the better example. Let's call this, this is gonna be a heated grip. So this comes out, a heated grip is really just a resistor. That resistor creates heat and that is what keeps your hands from freezing when it's cold. So you're adding grip heaters to your bike. Well, again, what, what size wire, what size fuse, how, how would you figure that out? Again, we know we've got a 12 volt battery and let's just for convenience say that we've got a four ohm resistor and the symbol for ohms is uh, the Greek letter omega and write that a little bit more legibly kind of like a horseshoe with some feet um, 
So now, the, let's say the question is, what fuse should we use to protect our, our heated grips here? Uh, we can figure that out because we can come back and use this equation here. Uh, we know the resistance and we know the voltage, and now all we need to know is what the current is. So rearranging this slightly, we end up with V over R equals I, subbing in actual numbers, that is 12 over 4 equals 3. So we've got 3 amps of, of current. So now we've figured out how many amps this 4 ohm uh, grip heater draws. And that would mean we could size the fuse at 5 amps, just so there's a little bit of uh, safety factor, a little bit of overhead in case our calculations are wrong or uh, this draws a little bit more. Just some fudge factor in there. Um, the other part of uh, sizing fuses and selecting fuses is making sure that you're not connecting um, wire that's too small for that given amperage. And just some quick rules of thumb, the Wire size uh, kind of has a finite limit for how much power it can handle. 18 gauge is good up to about 15 amps. Um, 12 gauge is good up to about 40 amps. And this is all with respect to chassis wiring on a motorcycle where you never really have any wire lengths that are much longer than maybe three or four feet. Um, there's a lot that goes into actually appropriately uh, sizing fuses and circuit protection. But for our purposes, 15 amps for 18 gauge, um, uh, 40 amps for 12 gauge and uh, I think it's somewhere around about 7 amps for 22 gauge uh, that should keep you out of trouble and in general when you're using 22 gauge wire that's going to be on your input side and there's no real current that flows over there anyway but just just for additional information now we were just talking about different gauges of wire and I realize that maybe there are a few people out there that don't know what that means and probably a lot of our friends in Europe and um, other, other countries where they don't use gauge. Uh, gauge refers to American wire gauge. It's kind of an, an unintuitive and archaic sort of weird measurement system that we've decided to use in the US. And I don't have any real good answer for why that's the way it is, but like so many things, it's just the way it is. Um, the way the gauge system works is actually smaller numbers are physically larger and really large numbers are physically smaller wires. So if you were to say take a, a single OT, which means one zero, that gauge wire would be almost the size of this, um, this marker. But then as you get into like a 22 gauge wire, that's much, much smaller, more on, on the order of maybe like a 16th of an inch or something like that. It's much smaller um, wire when you get down to the 22 gauge and the 28 gauge. Uh, when we talk about 18 gauge, that's kind of your, your normal output gauge wiring. That's what you would run to your lights, to uh, ignition system, charging system, etc. cetera. Um, the 12 gauge would be more for combined features, uh, combined devices, when you have a bunch of things that are spliced together and you need to carry more power. Um, main fuses, uh, common grounds, all those kinds of things. And when you get to your battery cables, um, general rule of thumb for battery cables is about 6 gauge. Alright, so another real world example that we can talk about is when you have a headlight that say has a independent low beam and an independent high beam and you actually want to have both of those on at the same time. This, for clarity, this means something other than an H4 where both of the low and high beam are actually contained within the same bulb. This means you have one bulb over here, you have another bulb over here and um, you want to have both of those turn on at the same time when you turn your high beam on. So we've got our headlight example up here and right now we just have this one, uh, one switch for the low beam and let's add another one for the high beam. And so just make a quick mark, this one's high and this one's low. So right now, the way that most headlights are set up if they're designed to use an H4 is you would connect only one at a time. So you'd have low beam, and then when you wanted high beam, you open that one up and connect high beam, and now low beam is turned off. But on your bike, let's say you've got a new super cool Street Fighter headlight and you want to have both of them turn on at the same time, but you still need to have uh, separation, you need to have a low beam. So let's start with both those switches open just because. Just um, and now we're going to use a diode to 
make it so it only powers the powers both lights when it's on high beam. So we'll just add that diode right here and it gets added so that the current can flow from the high to the low, but it can't flow from the low to the high. So again, we close the switch for the low beam and current can flow. This is blocking it, can't go to the high beam, flows down low beam back through the ground connection. Open that one up, close the high beam. Now current flows through the high beam, lights that one, also flows through the diode, can't go this way, the switch is open, does go this way through to the low beam, and now you've got both lights on, even though you've only got one switch. That can be useful uh, for some of the M unit installations because that is also the way the M unit works. And it, you only really run into this if you're using some type of a light that doesn't have both a high and a low beam in the same bulb. And there's another thing that I think is worth mentioning or at least pointing out, and that is in this entire discussion, we've been talking about DC current. Um, now, there's DC and there's AC and there's also AC-DC, but AC-DC is a band and they're awesome, but uh, AC and DC current are completely separate and they don't mix very well. Um, they can, there are reasons for it, but in terms of your motorcycle, you really need to keep the AC and the DC totally separate. The reason the motorcycle uses a DC system is because the battery needs to be DC. Um, AC means alternating current, that means it's basically creating a sine wave all the time. So it's going high, low, high, low, high, low. Uh, lots of reasons for why that makes sense in your house. And that's because your house doesn't use a battery, but on the bike, it does use a battery. So we need DC current. And that means it's just a, if this is our graph and this is voltage and this is time. So we've got voltage and time. That means DC is just constantly up. This, in this case, voltage and time. Now, let's say that's 12 volts. It's just DC, 12 volts all the time. Direct current, that's what it means. All right, so one of the other things that I really, I wanted to uh, get across in this, in this series um, was kind of, and you maybe heard me reference it a few times, and it's this concept of electrical nodes. Um, really, if you've sized your wire appropriately or even remotely close to appropriately, um, anywhere along that wire is the same electrical potential um, as the beginning or the end or anywhere else. And so when you're looking at a schematic, it doesn't matter if you tie in, you know, here or here or here or here, this is all the same voltage. Um, if you're on the other side of the switch, obviously there's some switched um, current, whether the switch is on or not. But if I needed to tie into this, if I made my splice here, or if I made it here, or if I made it here, none of that matters. It could be anywhere along that wire. And if I wanted it to be after the switch, tie in here, or here, or here, or anywhere. So when we see an electrical schematic that looks like this, where we've got a battery, and this comes off, and it goes to something here, and then it goes over here, and goes to something else over here and something else over here like this. And then maybe there's something else over here and then it eventually gets back. All right, so anywhere along this wire, this is all the same electrical potential. Anywhere in, now let's just actually circle this, show it a little bit more clearly. So anywhere along here, this is all the same electrical potential anywhere along here, all the same electrical potential, anywhere in here, the same. And of course, that is also the same. So if you needed to make splices, anywhere along that wire is just fine. Anywhere in this section, if you needed to tie in here. So when you look at your electrical diagram, where they show those splices doesn't actually matter as long as it's on the correct side or between the correct set of components. That's the only part that actually matters. I hope I've explained that in somewhat of a uh, understandable way. Um, one of the other things that I think we really should take a second and talk about is, uh, is grounding. It's not really that difficult of a concept. I'm sure you understand what it is. I just want to clear up uh, the, the general uh, paradigm for motorcycles and that is Normally, on most um, 
non-British motorcycles made after about 1960 or 70, you pretty much guaranteed to have a what's called a negative earth. And that means you don't run a wire all the way back to the battery necessarily. Instead, you just take the battery and tie it to the motorcycle chassis. And in this case here, we've got our motorcycle with the frame and an engine and some stuff and forks and things. We've got a battery in here and that battery just gets tied directly to the frame. And now the entire frame, because it's made of metal, is effectively a ground connection. So when you've got your headlight, the headlight is up here and you just take that ground and connect it to the frame. And because the battery is connected to the frame, it is also connected to the headlight. And the way that that's shown schematically is just that you always have this little symbol here, that's a ground symbol. Anytime you see that, that means it's connected to chassis, which is synonymous with saying it's connected to the negative terminal of the battery. Now, I hope that wasn't too complicated or uh, too dumbed down and that, that maybe helps explain uh, sort of the concept of how electricity works on your motorcycle. Uh, I don't want to get too far into you know, the rigorous academics, but hopefully this is a reasonable overview of the basic fundamentals. Um, we've got another video that we've just shot that is how to plan your project and how to actually go through and create a schematic wire diagram for virtually any bike. And uh, if this was helpful and you're starting your project, that one will probably be even more helpful. So take a look for that. If you like these videos, why don't you go to RevivalCycles.com, take a look at all the great products that we offer. And we always, always say, we sell the same products that we use, which means we know exactly how they work. That means we can help you integrate them into your project and we can help you solve problems as you run into them. If you do have an issue with a specific application or a problem on your project, send an email to tech support at revivalcycles.com and we'll be happy to take a look at that and help you get your project back on the road. Thanks for watching.